All right, thank you. Uh, a few minutes early here, but I'll go ahead and get started since we can't fit many more people in here, right? Talk louder. Okay. Um, I don't think your mic's on. His mic is on, but it's just a recorder. It doesn't broadcast to you. Okay, I will try to speak louder. So, raise of hands, how many of you feel uh, like this about CSS? Okay, a few of you that, that like it. Okay, how many of you feel like this? <laughs> okay, good. And uh, lastly, how many, how many people do I have like this that CSS is just kind of, eh, what? Okay, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be revealing any deep, dark secrets about CSS and, and, and why it can be as confusing as it is sometimes. Uh, but hopefully you can learn a few uh, techniques and ways to combine the things you may already know or some of the things you don't know that I'll be going over to do more complicated and advanced things with your design and CSS. So the main things I want to cover in this talk today are talking about shadows, gradients, transforms, transitions, animations, media queries, and nth child selectors. There are a lot of other things we could go over. Uh, these are just a few uh, that I've picked out and come up with uh, three kind of mini projects that will highlight some of these principles. The first one we're going to look at is an iOS 6 style popover. I designed this, uh, this talk and demo before iOS 7, and since then I thought about reworking it, but iOS 7 is just too easy because it's so flat and, and everything. So we're sticking with the, with the old school design because it's a little harder to do this. Um, so we'll talk about all the different um, pieces here. We're going to focus on the shadows, gradients, and transforms uh, to design something th like this with just uh, CSS. So step one, we're going we're gonna to look at this frame. So we have... Uh, rectangular frame, rounded corners, and a bit of this shiny uh, web 2.0 gradient thing going on at the top. So, like I said before, some of this stuff will be very basic and, and everyone will probably know how to do this, but I'm going to go through just kind of step by step how you might approach a problem like this. You take that design element and you say, how can I recreate this with CSS? We'll start with the, just that frame. So we've created a class. Uh, a div with the class popover, uh, giving it a width and a background color and set a border radius on it appropriately. Then we want to add uh, this gradient uh, on here. So you can see we've removed the background. Um, you could keep that there. We're using um, a background image here. And for all the examples I've done, I've removed all prefixing, so you're responsible to do that on your own. I'll, you'll get a link to the slides. Uh, at the end, you can, you can go look at it. Um, so like this linear gradient, if you're using that, you need to put vendor prefixes in there if you're going to um, use that. But I've removed that just to simplify all my code samples. So we add a gradient here. So uh, this is a basic linear gradient. You can see the bottom of that code there says we're starting at the top, and we have our first color stop, which is that light blue, the lightish the light, lightest blue-gray there, um, starting at zero pixels, and then we go to uh, a slightly darker gray-blue at 24 pixels down, and then there's the hard edge where we get to the, what was the old background color. So that linear gradient fills in the background, and we've added a border around uh, the whole thing as well that's the same color as that, that final dark background color to just help the top edge of that um, popover kind of pop and stand out from a light background. So the next thing I want to do is add some of the subtle details that you'll see. These top, the top one is what we just saw, and this, the second one down there, while it's hard to see, has added three different shadows to it. There's an inset shadow, which gives a little bit of a, a gleam to that top edge. And then there's a drop shadow, as well as a light uh, outer shadow that helps, once again, have that element pop from the drop shadow. And these are all 
very subtle things that you may not run into, but if you have this kind of design coming in from somebody and you want to recreate it perfectly, these are the steps you might need to take. The third image there is showing how uh, those same three shadows, but with colors that stand out a little bit more. We've got the red, cyan, and magenta. So you can see for shadows, we use the box shadow property. Once again, you would need to prefix this. Um, uh, so that first line there is an inset shadow, so that's how we get the little, uh, the, uh, the little inset top shadow there that makes the, uh, the edge pop out a little bit. And then the second line in the box shadow is the uh, faint white line. You, can't, you can hardly even see it on this one, especially on the projector. Uh, it's hard to see even on my screen, but it's, it's faintly there. Um, that's represented by the cyan line that you see going around here. And then the third line there is this um, soft drop shadow over here. Yeah? So I'm, uh, I'm just displaying my novice, but you can just have three separate box shadows by comma separating them? And yes. Yeah. So that's one of the things you can, you can have. Typically, you'll see a lot of places you use a single box shadow, but you can just have a comma separated list of as many of them as you'd like, which allow you to do some things like this, um, which is really cool. That you, that you can just as, list as many as you want to have, and uh, they'll show up. And I believe, I think it's in reverse order as far as the way you would think about it. So the last one in your list, uh, no, I'm getting confused now. I don't remember. You can play around with it. I, don't, I, I think it's, it's reverse to at least how I thought about it intuitively. Um, so I think the last one may be at the bottom of the stack. And the first one is on top, but I could be wrong. Someone, someone here may actually know that. But okay, yeah. And if there's any questions, please feel free to stop me and and ask as we go through this. Uh, so now we'll talk about the content here. So we have the the two main parts. We have the little header bar, and then we have the the big uh, inset uh, content section. So for the header, uh, we're going to, um, I've kind of grayed out the boring stuff that you would probably know, you know, text the line center, set the font size, set the height, all that, the line height and all that kind of stuff. Um, but along with the box shadow, there's a text shadow. So it's uh, hard to see, but you can see there's a little bit of a, a shadow above this um, text, which gives it kind of that recessed feel uh, that was so... Uh, common with the Web 2.0 look. Um, so that's, you can see this line here, text shadow, a very similar format here to box shadow. Uh, the parameters, if we go back and we look at box shadow, uh, the parameters is an optional inset followed by uh, an X offset, a Y offset, um, then the amount of blur that you want, and that fourth parameter uh, is basically a solid um, um, offset for that um, gradient. So that's how we're able to get those solid lines that don't have any sort of blur to them, is using that uh, fourth parameter there. And the fifth is your color. The, uh, that fourth parameter is optional uh, when you're doing your, your shadows um, as well. So the text shadow, very similar to that. It does not have the solid offset. So it has the same as the first three. It's got an X offset, a Y offset, and then the amount of blur. In this case, since we just want to shift it up one pixel and we don't want any blur, we've had a negative one pixel in the Y direction and zero for the amount of blur with a uh, semi-transparent black uh, for the color there. For the body down here, it's another uh, fairly standard just box uh, with an off-white background and a border radius of seven. So I wanted to get uh, an inner shadow for that content box. Here it's, it's hard to see, but there is a slight inset shadow uh, in here um, making it look like that content is recessed. Uh, so that's pretty easy to do, as we, sh we talked about before, this box shadow property on the content. We can just say we want it to be inset, 
We want it two pixels offset in the y direction, and we want it three pixels of blur, and we want that semi-transparent black again. Uh, so this causes a problem in that you can, you can add the shadow there, but if you have content inside there that you want to scroll, as you scroll, that content will be on top of the shadow, which, if you're nitpicky like I am, isn't good enough. Um, so a way around that that I found was using the after pseudo element. Um, if you're not familiar with those, basically you can use, there's an, both an after and a before pseudo element, which means you can specify with CSS, uh, basically by default it acts like a span that is the, the first and or the last child of your element. Um, and so by doing that, I've used the after pseudo element. I set the content of it to an empty string, so it's just an empty um, element right now. Uh, and then I set that, use position absolute, and I basically size another pseudo element to be the same size as that content area and put it on top and use a box shadow on that with the transparent background. So it's always on top of your content. So as you scroll, the shadow is still on top of the content as you scroll. Um, the key to this, though, is if you want users to be able to interact with, the, with your content inside there, they're going to be blocked by that pseudo element that's on top of everything. So that's why I've added, there's this pointer events none. Beware this does not work on IE 10 and below. So, uh, you know, our favorite. Um, but someday you can use this and have people um, <laughs> be able to do that. So that the pointer events none will basically have that element just not respond to any um, user input and events will just pass through it. That applies to JavaScript events too? Yeah, it's totally ignored. It will not capture any events. Uh, at least pointer events. I'm not sure about all events. Um, I think it would it can it can capture other other events, but the pointer events it doesn't capture. Okay. Last piece of this popover, we want to get that little carrot at the top. So we're going to start by just creating another element, and we're going to get it positioned where we want it to be. So here we can use the CSS transform attribute. Uh, so we've created just a regular uh, 24 by 24 pixel div, and we're using absolute positioning to set its uh, left to 50%. And then we use the CSS transform, this bottom line. With transforms, you can do translations, which is movement in an X or Y direction. You can do rotations, uh, and you can also skew things. Uh, you can scale things. There are several different things. If you um, Google CSS transform, you'll see some really great demos about all the things you can do there. In this example, we've translated in the x direction negative 14 pixels. That's because our left 50% would put the left edge of that div in the middle, and we want the center of it to be in the middle. So this may be similar to setting a negative margin left, if you've ever used that technique to center things. Uh, you can also do that with your CSS transform. So we move it back to the left, negative 14 pixels, which happens to be um, about what we need once it's rotated. Uh, and then we rotate, you can see that bottom line there, rotate 45 degrees. Um, so that will give us our nice little diamond up there. Okay, now to fill it in. <clears throat> We'll add a little border to the top edge of that that we want to match the outside border of our popover. So we set the border, uh, in this case, to black. And then we set the bottom and the right borders to transparent because that once you've rotated it, that's the bottom two are your bottom and your right uh, borders. So it'll, it'll translate the borders. The borders are applied after it's translated. Yeah, so all of those. All of the CSS transforms are done after the fact, after any all rendering everything else. It doesn't affect the flow of your document. It's basically, you can think of it as just being done by the GPU, even though it may not always be done by the GPU. It is sometimes. But. So if you give it border bottom and rotate it 180, it will show up with the border at the top? Yep. 
Yep, exactly. Am I still talking loud enough? Okay. <laughs> okay. So then I uh, wanted to throw a gradient on that. Uh, if you notice from the original design, the tip of that little carrot is even lighter than the top of the, the little shiny bar. So, you know, take your static design, go into Photoshop or GIMP or whatever you like, figure out what color that should be, play around with it till you get the right gradients, and throw that on there. So, um, here we've used the same linear gradient that we talked about. Um, figuring out the right colors, and I go from the, a, a very light color to a darker gray, and then I go to a fully transparent version of one of those blue-gray colors uh, there. But you'll see you end up with these little lines at the bottom. Does anyone know where those came from? Yeah, the transparent border. So what are we looking at under there? So we're looking at that gradient. We set it as a background image. That gradient gets repeated just because CSS treats gradients just like it's an image. So you'll notice that when you use a, a, a gradient there, we're setting it to the background image attribute in CSS. So it's treating that gradient just as a normal image that's being tiled, like it does by default with any background image. So in order to fix this, there's two things you can do. You can set no repeat on that background, which will have it just be the, the one there that you wanted. You can also set background clip to the content box. So by default, as you can see, you make a transparent border. The background fills out underneath the borders. If you don't want that, you can set the background clipping to the content box, which is inside the borders. So even though we have transparent borders, you'll no longer see uh, anything that's that's under them. So two different, two different ways to solve that little um, issue. Last thing we want is the slight inset shadow there to match the top um, single pixel inset shadow of the rest of the popover. So once again, we use our box shadow with inset. We've had to um, drop it in one pixel both X and Y since it's rotated. We want it to go down from the way we're looking at it, but an unrotated space, you're going one to the right and one down to get that shadow. And then you can see it matches up quite nicely, and we end up with the popover. Uh, here's a link to a code pen which has all the code for this, so you can go there and play around. Like I said, at the end of this, I'll give you a link to, the, to this deck, and you can get all these links and, and play around with that as well. But um, if you want to jot down that WFX uh, DI and, and Nemo Frost uh, is my name there. So, okay. Any other? What's that? Oh, sorry. Yep. Keep that up for a second. So, any questions about that example before we move on to the next one? I'm curious why the, the gradient. Is everything the transforms are applied last of all. So everything that you, um, oh, got your, yeah, right. yeah, got gotcha. you, yeah, yeah. So in this gradient, we, that first line of the gradient says top left. When you say top left, you're telling it that you want to have a diagonal gradient that goes from the top left uh, through the other way. So. By setting a diagonal gradient, the rotation unrotates it and, and goes top down. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions about that? It's actually a, a, an L, a DL, not a DI. DL, thank you. Okay. I'm sure it's not a one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I did test that one. Okay. Are we ready to go move on? Okay. Next example, we're going to look at an animated progress bar. So this is uh, some of these examples are, are fairly contrived and just a way to, to bring a bunch of these principles together and that you would 
not necessarily want to actually do this, but showing what you can do, right? And, and uh, giving you the tools that you need. So with this example, we're going to be talking about gradient patterns, transitions, and animations. Okay, so uh, give you, I thought that this one was supposed to animate um, and show you what the end result is, but it's apparently not. Basically, we're going to want these stripes, these candy stripes, to be animating across the bar as the bar is, is advancing. So you'll see what I mean in a bit. Step one, we're going to create this outer bar. Here we're using some of the principles we've already talked about. We set a border radius on a div, um, give it a linear gradient. Uh, this is another uh, format. So you can see in this linear gradient, it says to bottom instead of top. So you can, there's a lot of different ways you can um, specify your gradients. You can also, also notice before we had gradients using pixel values. Here we're using percentages. So we have this background going from CCC to DDD at 0% and 100%. Um, then we also add a box shadow on top of that um, to make it look a little more recessed. So just to add some of the lighting effects there, we have both the gradient and the inset shadow. Then we've got our, our bar inside. By default, we have it set to width 0%. That way with you know, JavaScript or whatever you want, you can you can set the width to just a percentage. It makes sense as you're writing code. If you're downloading something, you can just adjust that width. And if it's 100%, it'll fill the whole thing, and zero uh, will not be there in a way that makes sense. Um, we have, um, once again, a slight um, shadow on the bottom. You probably can't see that. There's a dark, slightly darker line uh, at the bottom of that uh, just to help it pop a little bit. Now for the fun stuff. Okay, so patterns are just complicated usages of gradients. Uh, so if you Google uh, CSS patterns, there's lots of different sites that have collections of kind of cool patterns that people have come up with uh, using sets of linear gradients uh, as background images. And here's an example of one. And I wanted to kind of explain uh, more about these color stops in gradients and how they work and how you would go about creating this. First of all, let's look at this overall pattern. We want you have to create a repeating pattern that's tileable uh, in order for it to, to work as a CSS um, pattern as a background image. So you can see on the bottom here we have kind of a small representation. You can see how we get that candy striped bar by just connecting a series of these square patterns. And that's so you can create the pattern and then you can slice out one piece that's the smallest repeating chunk and then we can try to recreate that here. So starting in the bottom left corner you can see once again our linear gradient has a different way to, uh, to specify the direction. We're using 45 degrees now uh, instead of top left or in this case it would have been bottom left. Um, so you can use degrees as well. We're going to start with our first color stop is going to be at the 30% mark. Uh, on the right here in the code, you can see I've, I've labeled these color A, B, C. Uh, A is the lighter uh, color. B is, is the darker color. And C is just fully transparent. So the middle shade here, you're actually just seeing through to the background color. So we're applying a mostly transparent white followed by, by mostly transparent black, followed by transparent, followed by uh, mostly transparent black, etc. cetera. Uh, for each of these sharp lines, you can see it requires two color stops. So for that first one, at 30%, we have a color stop with A, with color A, so that, that transparent white at 30%, followed by transparent black at 30%. Then we go to the, how far we want that black or that darker stripe to go. We want that to go to 34% of that same color. Then we'll, at, then we'll stay at the same 34% and jump over to our transparent. Uh, and that's right at this edge here. And you can see that that pattern just repeats as we go until you get your pattern uh, accomplished. And this, getting the percentages right, you know, was doing some geometry um, and 
and some guesswork as well. So if you're going to do something like this, <laughs> you, you play around with it um, until it looks good. In, in this case, for, um, for CSS, it's, it's less about the origin and more about the, di it's the direction you're going. The origin, um, take that back, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so it will, it will always go basically from the the edge of the box that that you're that you would be starting on if you were drawing an array through your shape at that angle if you think about it. so um, if we were doing 30 degrees it would still be that corner but it would be going at a 30 degree angle um, uh, from there and then once you jumped past 90 degrees then it would be jump over to that bottom right corner so you're, you're going 45 degrees, you hit 90, uh, and then if you go to 91 degrees, it's going to be, well, you can think of it coming from that bottom right corner. You can think of it coming from anywhere along the bottom. In the same way that this one, you can really think about that as coming from, from anywhere along there um, because that pattern is really repeating out beyond the box. So however you want to conceptualize it. Okay, so we've got our stripes in there. Those are looking nice. Uh, this is putting it all together here without the comments. This is our code for that. We set a background size to be the uh, size of that repeating tile and the background image to that crazy set of color stops. Uh, then we want to have a transition on that. So transitions, CSS transitions, uh, allow it to basically animate CSS properties uh, for you uh, over a given time. So once again, this is, would require a prefix, a vendor prefix, depending on what, you're, what browsers you're targeting. Um, for this one, the format, uh, you have transition colon, and then the property name that you want to be animating. In this case, we want to animate the width of the progress bar, which is that inner blue bar. And we want to do it over a duration of 200 milliseconds. and we want to do it with an easing function of ease. That's built in. There are several different easing functions. If you Google CSS transitions, you'll see there's, there's a few more parameters to that as well. Um, but these are the more common ones used. There's just the name of the property you want to uh, animate, how long you want it to take, and what kind of easing function uh, you want it to do. <laughs> so this, is, this would be nice if you're you know, getting a callback in JavaScript and you're updating the width of that bar and you don't want it to just chunk along, you can update the width to, you know, from 50% to 75% and you don't have to worry about animating it. It will just smoothly animate um, up to that new value. Then animations. So, uh, say on top of that, we want to add this backwards movement of the stripes to get the to give the user the illusion that your whatever is loading faster than it is. Um, so to do that, we'll use the animation um, CSS attribute. The way this works, the first, uh, first value there you specify is a set of keyframes. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the bottom chunk of code there. We have the keyframes are named progress dash bar dash animate. You can name these whatever you want, and you can see that first code block is specifying a set of keyframes for that name. So use this keyframes um, keyword with the at, uh, give it a name, and then inside you can have from and to, and you're just setting the CSS properties you want applied. Uh, at, the, the, at those keyframes. You can also specify percentages in here. Um, so you could use 0%, 10%, 20 Like You can have as many stops, as many keyframes as you want inside there to specify all kinds of complicated animations if you want. In this case, we're just saying we want to go to the background position. We want it to be offset in the x direction by 40 pixels. And then when it's done, we want it to be offset by 0. 
remember that tiled image that we had of the stripes is 40 pixels big. So basically all we're saying is we want that 40 pixels to slide across and then it will reset itself and slide across. But you won't notice because when it resets it's the same, it'll look the same as it did when it, was, when it had started. So with that animation we say we want to use those keyframes. We want that animation to take two seconds. We want a linear um, uh, easing function. Um, and then we want it to just go on infinitely. And it will just keep going. Um, <laughs> IE 11. <laughs> Not sure about 10. This might work in 10 prefixed. Give it a try. Uh, so with infinite, you can also have animations reverse when they're done. So you can have it kind of go back and forth, running the, the animation forward, then backward, then forward, then backward. There's lots of other things you can do um, with that. Once again, uh, a quick Google will give you some more insight around animations. Uh, here's the URL for that um, and all the code uh, that I used to create that little sample. Any other questions on this one before I move on? I don't know, maybe I missed something, but what was controlling the width of the progress bar on that last slide? Oh, that's, I've just got JavaScript doing that. Yeah. It was just to, to show you what you could be doing. Yeah. So if you start an infinite animation, how would you invoke a stop? There, so because that is just, um, you know, a property uh, or just part of that animation property, you could set another class on that element that would set the animation property to um, none or something like that, and it would just clear it out and it would stop animating. Um, and I, I can't remember if there are other ways to do that. There are ways you can, um, I think, find out if it is animating and stuff like that, but... That's a little bit beyond what I prepared for today. But, but yeah, that's the easy, the easy answer is to have another class that just clears off the animation property to stop it from animating. Class that has animation. Yeah, so just another class. You might say progress bar static as a class, and in there, you know, animation none. Or you could say animation progress bar animate two seconds linear without the infinite. Um, and then it would could, um, just do it once and, and be done. And you can specify the number of times you want it to go through that loop instead of infinite. Okay. Do you know if the GPU paints the pattern or the CPU? I don't think so because I've actually recently run into some really terrible performance things. I was actually using CSS patterns on a website and it was causing some really bad jank and I made an image and use that instead because it was way faster. So um, I didn't try some of the tricks with like Z translation to try to force GPU uh, acceleration, but by default, I don't think so. Okay. All right. So for our last example, uh, you need to create a really cool uh, sort of pseudo interactive periodic table. So uh, you want to do all this with CSS. You want to have the colors applied to the correct element groups with CSS. You want to have them get bigger and go away with CSS because you just don't like JavaScript for some reason. <laughs> um, I don't know what your problem is because JavaScript is awesome, but Say you wanted to do this. Let's talk about how you might accomplish this. Okay. Yeah, there is, there is no JavaScript here for any of that. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about a few things. Playing nice with hover, um, media queries, and nth child selectors. This is probably the most contrived of all my examples, but it's still fun. So playing nice with hover, here's the problem. We create this beautiful thing. We, we 
naively go and just put a hover attribute in CSS on this beryllium, and when we hover over it, it gets big because we know how to scale things, and that's great. But then we're hovering over this, and then you realize, oh no, if I then hover over lithium that's to the left of beryllium, you can't get to it because it's still hovering over your giant beryllium. <laughs> so if you want to get around that, uh, there's some trickery. So once again, fairly contrived, but maybe you'll run into to something someday and you'll think back and thank me silently in your head. Um, okay, so what I've done is basically wrapped each of these elements uh, in two elements instead of a single one. So we have a cell, which is the, the red lines that go around everything, and then we have the element, which is the little element card that's inside there uh, with a little bit of uh, margin around the, the right and bottom there. So uh, the key points here are on that element uh, we've gone back to use our friend, the pointer events none that doesn't work doesn't work in IE less than 11. Um, so that way it will just ignore uh, any sort of interaction when you get to your giant version because you can scale that up. But we put the hover um, transform on the cell itself. So looking at this, we have our cell on hover, then any child class or any uh, descendant that's an element. We can use our CSS transform. We can scale it up by three in, in both directions and uh, set the Z index to one to make sure that it's on top of everything else. Uh, then you get the desired effect where you can hover over that beryllium, but when you, when you mouse over to lithium, because the pointer events none, it will just get that hover event on the lithium's cell container, if that makes sense. Okay. The, uh, there's a bit of a namespace collision here with a div with the class element because they're all elements. And so this, this one gets a little confusing sometimes with the usage of the word element. So we've created this beautiful set of elements and we want it to be responsive. So here we have two different versions. We say on a phone, we maybe don't want to have, we don't have room to show the atomic number or the name or the atomic weight. So we just want to get rid of those things and we want to, in the large version, there's this kind of glowy, uh, shadow going on around the text and on the the mobile version it just is too hard to read with that so we want to get rid of that we just want to kind of have slightly different versions uh, for different size screens uh, so in this example we've gone mobile first and I don't really care if you do mobile first or mobile last um, it's kind of your own preference and what that means is whether you're you're specifying all the styles for the smallest screens first and then saying, as I get bigger, adjust X, Y, and Z, and even bigger, adjust X, Y, and Z. Or you can start the opposite and say, for normal big screens, I want the style to be like this, and if I get smaller, adjust X, Y, and Z, and if I get even smaller, adjust X, Y, and Z. So in this case, I've started assuming a small screen, and as we get bigger, I'm changing some things. So with this mobile-first um, design, the element, we're using absolute positioning and right and bottom to actually add the separation between the elements. Um, so we have that set at one pixel for small screens and for our uh, atomic numbers and the details section there, we set the opacity to zero uh, by default. Uh, instead of just doing display none uh, because the content in there was all flowed normally, uh, we just hit it using opacity. You could also do visibility hidden if you wanted to to keep the flow the same uh, for those cells. Then here's the media query. So once again, this keyword of media with the at symbol in front of it. And then in parentheses, we have this min-width. 
600 pixels. So that means that anything that is 600 pixels, any screen that is 600 pixels or more, will uh, have these styles applied uh, to, to the elements in there. Uh, there's the opposite is there. There's max width, and that's usually used if you're doing um, mobile last responsive design. So in this case, for a screen larger than 600, we want to add a little more space around our elements, so we adjust the right and bottom to two pixels. We go ahead and show the details by setting the opacity to one, and we adjust the font size for the symbol from nine pixels to 16 pixels. We've adjusted the height of the overall periodic table. Uh, and then for our uh, even bigger screens, we have 992 as another breakpoint. For that, we adjust the periodic table's height to 680 and set the font size up for the little, the tiny stuff and the large stuff again. Uh, and all those cells, I was just using percentages for all the, the columns uh, of the elements so that it will just scale to the width of the, the overall um, table. Not table element as in a table tag, but the div that represents the table. Okay. So we've done that, and what we really have ended up with is this top one. They're all the same color. Uh, you can hover over them, and they look really cool. Um, but now we want to color them. So this is where we're going to talk about nth child uh, selectors. So if you don't like algebra, you won't like nth child selectors. Uh, and if you do, then you might, you might just like them. Yeah. Great question. You shouldn't have asked that, though. I wasn't. <laughs> so I, I, haven't, I didn't do anything with Hover. You'd, if, if you wanted them to get bigger on mobile, you'd have to wire it up with Touch or JavaScript or something. But yeah, good question, though. Can't sneak anything by you guys. <laughs> That's good. OK. So the way nth child selectors work is you basically put in a little formula uh, you use colon nth child, nth dash child, and in parentheses, a little formula that can just be a number or it can be a formula with uh, basically of an a times n plus b format. So any number times n plus or minus any other number. Uh, both parts of that are optional, so you can just have uh, a number times n, uh, or you can just have, like I said, a positive or a negative number uh, in there. So n starts at 0 and then goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Um, so this little table is a really good example of showing you what would happen if you put in nth child uh, 2n plus 1. Basically, when it goes to render, it looks, uh, it starts going through n from 0 until, it, until nothing's changing. Uh, so at 0, if your formula is 2n plus 1, then you're going to get 0 times 2 plus 1 is 1. If n is 1, you get 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3, etc. So what that ultimately means is if you have something in your CSS that uses this selector, it will only select the first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh child of an element. Practically speaking, nth child selectors are used a lot for lists to do like zebra striping and stuff like that, and that's a very easy one. There are a few key words you can use with nchild, like even and odd, because those are such common use cases for this. Um, but if you ever want to do something more complicated, that's when you would use this a times n plus b kind of format. So we're going to try to style up these sections of the periodic table using the nchild selectors. First of all, we want to have the first two columns and the last six columns be a slightly different color. So to do that, we have our selector on the cells. And um, oh, by the way, each uh, row in the periodic table is in its own div. So they all have the same number of them. There's like an empty cell kind of spacers so that we can accomplish this. So the nth child negative n plus 2 uh, is what gives us these first two columns. So you can see if you put in a 0, you're going to get a 2, which will select uh, that first column. If you put in uh, a 1, then you get 
or you get the second column, you put in a one, you get the first column, and if you put in a two, you get zero, and you don't get anything. And then for your n plus 13, you can see if you put in a zero, that's going to give you 13, which is that first column here, and then it would give you 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, and so we'll select all those things. So with the combination of those two nth child selectors, we can set a new background color and select all of those elements. Then we do something similar for the first column and all the non-metals. Uh, so here we have the first child. That's an easy one. Okay, so we've, we've used nth, nth child one, which just is the same exact thing as using a first child um, selector. Um, then we have uh, for the different rows, we want to select a different number of them. So we have our nth child two. Uh, so the second row, then we select from 14 on to get carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen etc. And we repeat this pattern to get the rest of those uh, there. We want to get our noble gases, so we do something similarly. Notice here we're selecting only the row, we're using a negative n plus 6 for the rows, so we only get the first six rows, followed by an nth child selector on the columns to get just the 18th one. And there we have it. Oh, and we select the uh, lanthanides and actinides also with another one um, using similar things. And once again, we end up with our periodic table. If you look at my example, you'll see I did something a little differently so that these edge pieces don't uh, blow up centered like the rest of them do. They blow up along the edge or in the corner as you go up there. I didn't cover that, but that's another set of pseudos uh, or of nth child selectors I used for that. Um, there you have it. I'll leave this up in case you guys wanted to get that token.